welcome. Uh, the title today uh, is Storing Electricity as Molecules, the Promise of Renewable Natural Gas and Hydrogen. But before we get to that and our, to our two presenters from NREL, I would like uh, to welcome you all. Um, at CRES, we're promoting renewable energy solutions, and that includes technology and policy uh, for Colorado. Um, it's been uh, an organization that has been around for now 22 years, and uh, we're proud to have been one of those people who pushed for a renewable energy portfolio for utilities here in Colorado, and we managed to get that done not from the top down, but by voter um, consent. And um, so our chapter here at JCRES, the Jefferson County chapter of the Colorado Renewable Energy Society, um, is in Golden. Uh, and so uh, that means we have easy access uh, to the National Re Renewable Energy Laboratory, and uh, we'll afford ourselves of that access again tonight. Um, but before we go there, let me quickly announce to you uh, what else is cooking. Um, just two nights from now, on uh, the 3rd of September, Actually, that's not tonight, but it is the 3rd of September. Um, we have our chapter from the southeast of Colorado Seacrest talking about Beyond Coal, the future of Colorado Springs utilities. Uh, that's going to be interesting uh, because uh, quite a few people have a lot riding on coal, um, both on the negative and positive side. So that's September third. And to check up on all these, uh, you can go to our website, cres-energy.org. Uh, the following week, our Boulder chapter um, comes up with what's next for Colorado's electric vehicle markets. Uh, as an EV driver myself, that is another one that I'm not going to want to miss. That's uh, September 9th. And uh, yet another week from there, we ha are having our annual policy night with the Public Utilities uh, Commission's Megan Gilman and with State Senator Chris Hansen. That's organized by our Denver chapter uh, for uh, the 16th of September. And again, uh, all of this information can be found at crest-energy.org. And um, you can find links there to uh, many of the recordings of previous events that we've done. We have our own uh, YouTube channel, uh, which uh, has seen over half a million views. Um, and uh, we actually also have some presentations on specifically hydrogen uh, from another NREL researcher. Uh, Mark Roos on that channel, so check out our YouTube Crest channel. And with that uh, out of the way, let me introduce uh, the program for tonight. Um, as um, I've written in the announcement, uh, we do need a continued expansion of wind and solar electricity if we ever want to decarbonize the electricity sector. Um, however, um, getting to that goal will probably mean that we lastly need to overproduce uh, wind and solar, and then where does that electricity go? It's mainly at present being curtailed, which is a polite word for tossed. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, in places like California, we have a pretty severe discrepancy uh, seasonally between uh, what uh, power is, uh, what clean power is on offer and uh, what uh, the demand is. Um, 
so it appears there is a solution for that, uh, and at least a possible one, uh, and we'll hear about the pathways to that uh, solution uh, from two people, both working at NREL. Uh, one is Kevin Harrison, and the other one is Nancy Doe, They're working on a sector coupling solution uh, to help reduce curtailment, uh, recycle carbon dioxide from our waste streams, and provide a long duration energy storage solution using the existing natural gas network. There's two steps to that process. Uh, in one, uh, we have a low cost um, renewable electricity, um, uh, allowing us to produce hydrogen and oxygen uh, with a, an electrolyzer system. And then the second step, uh, uses uh, that hydrogen in a bioreactor to produce renewable methane, uh, which is equivalent to natural gas, and also drawing from CO2 from other sources like uh, dairies, wastewater, landfills, and even fermentation processes at breweries, of which we have quite a few. Um, the biggest benefit of this approach is how this process produces a direct replacement of fossil natural gas um, and uh, one that we can tie into with that expensive natural gas infrastructure where we can store huge uh, quantities of energy as molecules, basically, um, as methane. Well, in that case, we don't need batteries just the naturally occurring and self-replicating single cell biocatalysts. And that's also why we're gonna hear from uh, not just an engineer, um, this one being Kevin Harrison uh, in the fuels to grid integration section of NREL, but also from microbiologist Nancy Doe. Uh, Nancy is a senior scientist in NREL's biosciences group, working on biological processes that produce renewable fuels and chemicals. But um, uh, the way we've set this up, let us first go to Kevin Harrison, um, and then Nancy will give us a bit of the um, biochemistry involved uh, with their bioreactors. And I'm handing it now over to uh, Kevin uh, Harrison. And there you go, Kevin, it's all yours. Martin, thank you uh, for the introduction. And um, I'm just gonna bring up my slides to make sure everyone can see it. Still working, I think, but um, I'll just introduce uh, myself and I have uh, Nancy Dow here with me. We are currently at NREL. Um, in Golden, as many of you might know, we also have um, what we're calling the Flatirons campus up closer to Boulder. That, that is our other campus, previously known as the National Wind Technology Center. Um, and um, But today I'm talking to you from uh, Golden at our South Table Mountain campus in the Energy Systems Integration Facility. And um, Behind me, the blue screen is the control screen for our electrolyzer system. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but the, the spoiler is that we're uh, running a 750 kilowatt electrolyzer, uh, not right this second, we shut it down a couple hours ago, uh, producing hydrogen for research being conducted here at NREL. And um, as uh, Martin said, thank you for the nice introduction, Martin. Uh, I'm the engineer on the hydrogen side, and Nancy is the microbiologist taking care of the single-celled organisms converting hydrogen and CO2 into methane, or in this case, renewable methane. Um, and I, I won't go any further than that, so I don't spoil Nancy's <laughs> intro. But she's here. Uh, we're practicing social distancing. Um, and we will switch over about halfway through. Um, can somebody respond and make sure you can see my screen before I go on? Martin? I will yeah, and Martin, go ahead and turn off your webcam too. 
Turn it okay. off. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kevin, we'd love to see your webcam. We just, Martin was done talking, so let's have, uh, there you go. Fair enough, thanks. Thank you for that. Um, so the, the first slide is, is showing what many of us know and many of us have been hoping for for a long time is that the price of wind and solar generated electricity is among the cheapest and lowest cost electricity you can make today. And the bonus, of course, is that it's low carbon. Now, nuclear is also technically low carbon. Um, so when we talk low carbon, you, you would include nuclear. And if the day comes where there's an economical way to sequester CO2 from fossil plants, um, and, and that that work is continuing and we hope they're successful, you could include fossil generated electricity if it's low cost and low carbon in this conversation. Um, but at NREL, we're a little biased, as you could expect. Um, so now today we're, we're entering this world where we have low cost electricity. We want the expansion of, of wind and solar and geothermal and other ways to make um, renewable electricity. And, and we're, we, we sort of live in that world now. And, and that's really um, one of the enabling technologies, uh, the success of wind and solar to now start talking about what can we do with the electricity. And, um, I am going to go to the next slide, bear with me. I think there's a little bit of a delay. There we go. So this, this slide really shows where hydrogen fits in to this picture of our energy economy. Um, you, you can see uh, on the far left, we start with the same electricity production. But now we're talking about moving those electrons to molecules. And the first molecule we talk about is uh, hydrogen and, and, and oxygen. So when you split water, just like we did in high school, we use a little nine volt battery in a cup um, of water, hydrogen and oxygen evolve. Um, the electrolyzer systems of today are, are, are very um, commercial. They're commercially available. They're large scale. So, uh, Think about a megawatts worth of electrolysis, making hydrogen to help decarbonize um, our energy sector. And what we're here really to talk about is, is a, a little new. It's talking about waste streams and other sources of CO2. So biogas is a mixture of CO2 and CH4, as you can see in the bottom. Um, that comes from wastewater treatment plants, like Mar Martin mentioned, landfills, dairies, anything uh, that ferments. Uh, so if you're at Coors, they release CO2 into the atmosphere as part of their beer making process. So today, a lot of this uh, biogas, which is a mixture of these two greenhouse gases that is emitted to the atmosphere. What we're talking about is, is the green box in the middle. Uh, step one, make hydrogen. Step two, uh, combine that hydrogen with the methane, with the CO2, and let these organisms, these biocatalysts um, that are naturally occurring, they've been around for millions of years doing one thing. They take CO2 and hydrogen and convert it to methane. They produce water in the process, and they also produce heat. So now, we have renewable natural gas from biogas sources, and that is a drop-in direct replacement with, with fossil natural gas. Fossil natural gas is mostly made up of methane, CH4, and we have this expansive network to store energy. So we're talking about uh, renewable electricity, hydrogen production, recycling CO2, recycling methane. The bugs don't mind uh, methane uh, floating through this bioreactor. And Nancy will go into more detail about what that is to produce renewable natural gas to store those electrons um, in the natural gas network. So the National Renewable Energy Lab has been working with uh, other national labs and the Department of Energy to, to develop this concept known as hydrogen at scale. 
Um, this picture is the full concept, starting with electricity on the left, conventional storage at the top. Um, so batteries, of course, are included in this conventional storage picture. They do a nice job of storing electrons and putting them back on the grid. That's the one thing they do. They do that very efficiently uh, when you talk about round trip efficiency. Um, but we'll continue the conversation to the right. So hydrogen has a role in our economy already. As the text box in the lower left suggests, we make about 10 million metric tons of hydrogen each year. A lot of that goes to make fertilizer, um, ammonia for fertilizer, upgrading oil to, um, to gasoline. This particular talk is about synthetic fuels, renewable natural gas, and that takes CO2 plus hydrogen um, and uses the two and a half million miles of natural gas pipelines in the US, including underground storage uh, that I'll talk about, um, to store this renewable natural gas. So you're essentially storing this renewable electricity in molecule form. Um, and if you're making renewable natural gas, it's a drop in direct replacement. It has no material compatibility issues. The, it, when you're making, when you're heating water at your house with renewable natural gas, there is no difference, is really what I'm trying to say, with the fossil natural gas that we're used to. To finish the, the picture at the top, there is a growing number of hydrogen refueling stations in the U.S. Uh, California has the most of them, about 60, I believe, um, is in today's count, where you could fuel a car with hydrogen or you could fuel a bus or um, a heavy duty truck is becoming more and more popular where hydrogen and batteries are competing for heavy and medium duty um, transportation. Martin also uh, alluded to this fact that in California, they have a, a growing problem and it's not necessarily a, a really bad problem. Um, I may have lost the screen. Sorry, did um, did we lose the slides? Let me jump back to the slide I was on. Sounds weird. Um, okay, I'm going to assume that's back. California is curtailing or shutting off wind and solar um, to the tune of hundreds of thousands of megawatt hours of electricity each year. And you can see the graph not only of the monthly, um, but then the yearly totals in the upper right. And then so I did this back of the envelope calculation where each year they curtailed a certain amount of electricity from wind and solar prim primarily. That electricity feels turned into hydrogen. Uh, that's the third column in the table at the bottom. That's how many metric tons of hydrogen you could have made. And then what if you sent that hydrogen and you had a CO2 source, how many metric tons of CO2 could we be recycling um, instead of turning that, um, that wind and solar off? So this gives you a feel for this process, this two-step process is capable today of starting to recycle uh, CO2 into renewable natural gas by making hydrogen from a renewable electricity. This Picture of the United States shows about 110 operational RNG facilities with another 40 under construction. This is continually being updated and another around 60 um, being developed. And what this doesn't say is really the potential. So some people might be surprised to hear that there are 15,000 wastewater treatment plants in the US. There's about 3,000 landfills and there's about 37,000 dairies. Now, could you utilize every one of those? No, of course not. Um, but all of most of those are emitting the CO2 and the CH4 because they're, they're these biogas sources that we're talking about. Um, and what the facilities shown on the map are doing are separating the two gases. So they're separating the methane from the CO2. They're keeping the methane that's renewable natural gas, um, but they're letting the CO2 go. The difference between what we're talking to you about today about is the biomethanation process also upgrades the CO2 
into more methane. So that by the time the gases leave the bioreactor, step two, it's 98% pure methane. And also, um, there's an existing fueling infrastructure in the US. I'm showing the, the compressed natural gas and the liquid natural gas fueling um, and a lot of heavy duty trucks already running on CNG, for example. You'll see the UPS truck driving by um, or a garbage truck or a bus um, running off CNG. Well, there's no reason why this couldn't be renewable CNG. So beyond transportation, um, how, how do you really store this electricity? How can you store a lot of it? Um, you can see that the Energy um, Storage Association drew this map with batteries and pump storage and these more conventional ways of storing energy. But we're talking about really the upper right hand corner where we're creating hydrogen from water and then maybe using that hydrogen plus a CO2 source to create renewable natural gas. If you want to store a lot of energy, you move electrons into molecules and you take advantage of the existing natural gas network. Now, I, you can see along the, the x-axis along the bottom, you see one TWH, one terawatt hour. Well, that I can't even fathom how much energy that is. But what I do know is it takes a lot of batteries, 25,000 in this case, fully charged um, to store that energy. And I can tell you, now the, the calculation that SoCal Gas did, the little text box in the bottom, there's a lot of energy storage uh, with our partner, Southern California Gas Company, because they have four underground storage facilities. There's other underground storage facilities in places like Pennsylvania and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to store a lot of energy in molecular form. That's really the takeaway uh, from this graph. So why are we converting it to methane? It's a greenhouse gas. You know, there's you can start thinking about poking holes in it. Well, biogas sources are being emitted to the atmosphere whether we like it or not. Um, I showed the 110 facilities um, on that U.S. map, and I talked about the thousands of wastewater treatment plants and landfills and dairies. Well, we're converting it to methane, um, and 250 bar, for example, is about 3,700 psi, has a higher volumetric energy density than even liquid hydrogen. So if you cooled hydrogen down to near um, absolute zero, which is very cold, um, hydrogen turns into a liquid, um, and even methane at pretty moderate pressures. So firefighters and scuba divers, um, they wear tanks on their back to about this pressure, to about 250 bar, 3,700 PSI. Now, if you liquefy methane to LNG, you can see that the second red bar above that is um, LNG or liquid methane. So we're getting, we're picking up volumetric energy density by throwing sort of a carbon into the mix, if you will, a renewable carbon, a, a biogenic carbon um, that comes from our waste streams. So with that, what are we doing at NREL to help solve the problem? Well, we're, we're scaling these technologies. Um, so I'm sitting in the control room of um, our electrolyzer and hydrogen production facility. Uh, just off to my left is that system shown in the lower left. It's a 750 kilowatt electrolyzer. It makes 13 kilograms of hydrogen per hour. What does that mean? It means that um, we're making 13 gallons of gas equivalent. A kilogram of hydrogen has roughly the same energy content as a gallon of gasoline. And we all know what a gallon of gasoline can do for us. It can move us down the road 30, 40, or 50 miles, especially if you're driving a Prius, um, 50 plus miles perhaps. Um, I talk pressure, 30 bar pressure is about 450 PSI, so that little electrolyzer in the box in the lower left-hand corner produces hydrogen right out of the stack at 450 PSI. It's not doing it with a compressor, you're actually paying a, a small energy penalty to get higher pressure, and 
we have power supplies that could be powered from wind and solar or directly from solar. It's a direct current device. And then this hydrogen goes outside. This is the North Research Facility at the Energy Systems in Integration Facility. We pressurize hydrogen up to uh, 350 bar, which is 5,000 PSI, 700 bar, which is 10,000 PSI. And then we fuel cars. So number one off to the left, we're fueling vehicles at those higher pressures. We do research on compressors. Um, those are some of the blue and green pieces of equipment around number three, which is what we're here to talk to you about mostly. 700 liters is about 200 gallons, operates at elevated pressure. And Nancy will talk about why we do that, why we operate in 260 PSI. Um, and then we also have hydrogen storage on the right. Um, at 3,000, 6,000, and close to 13,000 PSI storage, storing a total of 350 kilograms of hydrogen, or 350 gallons of gas equivalent. So how do you make the hydrogen? You use this electrolyzer stack on the right. It's an electrochemical device um, that puts in water. So those, those tubes coming in from the top is deionized water, and then coming out the other tube, is deionized water and oxygen. The electricity comes in these wires, and these wires are duplicated on the backside of the stack. So there's a, a lot of copper coming in to bring in that DC power, that direct current power to the stack. And then where's the product? There's a half inch diameter stainless steel tube coming out the top, carrying hydrogen at 400 PSI. This picture alone sort of starts to tell the story of moving electrons to molecules. And some of the rules of thumb at the bottom for people who um, like to know how much hydrogen I could make. Well, on a, on a large scale, a megawatt scale, it takes 50 to 55 kilowatt hours of electricity to make one kilogram of hydrogen. On your utility bills, we pay uh, for a number of kilowatt hours, perhaps 12 cents. Um, that electricity price would be too much to make hydrogen uh, economically. Um, but if you get into lower rates and larger scales, and if you get that cost down to one to three cents, and Nancy has a great graph later showing why the, the sort of the magic range to make hydrogen economically. And this is my last slide. So um, with wind and solar being put on the grid at ever increasing penetrations, you will have more and more energy curtailment uh, because the times where you make wind and solar electricity don't always align when people are using it. Um, so that's why we're talking about energy storage. Well, in this case, the electrolyzer is a grid-friendly load. So it's consuming electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And what we show here in this graph is that we asked this 40 kilowatt electrolyzer, it's a relatively small system, to change its power level every second. And you could do that on a long duration and be this grid friendly dispatchable load that grid operators could use to help balance the grid, to help stabilize the grid. So as wind and solar naturally vary and that's what we expect. They're, they're not necessarily dispatchable loads right off the bat, but um, you can use loads as sort of a stabilizing um, grid support mechanism um, using these electrolyzers uh, to, to accomplish that. So I will turn it over to Nancy. So I'll just go ahead and introduce myself. Um, so I'm Nancy Dow, um, and I am a fermentation microbiologist here at, at NREL. Um, I have been at NREL uh, since 1992, so I've been here for a very long time. Um, and my, my background has been mainly in producing renewable fuels and chemicals from biomass. Um, but the last uh, few years, um, I got uh, tasked with uh, working with uh, this really interesting microorganism um, that uh, we're using for an energy storage project, which is a really um, interesting way of using 
uh, this naturally occurring um, organism that produces, um, you know, methane. Um, just like a lot of the organisms that are in the wastewater treatment plants and um, biogas facilities, uh, this particular microorganism, you know, only makes only makes methane. And so um, Kevin uh, was on the electrolyzer side of the house, and um, they needed um, somebody with a biological background um, to be able to um, work with uh, the um, particular um, strain. So. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to pick up from where Kevin left off. So um, this slide is is a, a very simplified process flow diagram um, of what we're working on. And and really what we're trying to focus on here at NREL is is um, mirroring that electrolyzer step step one uh, with the um, bioreactor and and the microorganism. And so you can see the arrows where the supply um, of CO2 from the different um, biogas sources, along with the hydrogen from electrolysis, um, go into this um, reactor, which is um, the, the current reactor that we have is about 20 feet tall and about 18 inches in diameter. It's really tall and skinny um, because it's designed um, for use for, for feeding gases um, to uh, the organisms. So a little bit different than what you would expect to see, um, say at a microbrewery, where um, those tanks are often you know, pretty um, short and fat. Uh, they don't have to worry about trying, they just need to sort of mix things around a little bit. Um, this particular reactor needs to be able to break that hydrogen and that CO2 down into small bubbles um, and get those um, bubbles to uh, the, the organism. Um, and like with all of life, um, not only do you, are we feeding the carbon source, which is the CO2, and the energy source, which is the hydrogen, we also need to supply nutrients. And you can see that in the bright uh, green box down, um, down below the reactor uh, box. And that is really a, a bunch of uh, salts. Um, so like uh, nitrogen and uh, magnesium and phosphate and potassium. So we're feeding that into the to the um, reactor along with the gases. So those organisms work on the gases, they work on the salts, and uh, they produce uh, methane and some water and some heat. Um, very surprisingly, these little single-celled organisms make a lot of, of um, heat when they're um, churning out uh, the, the renewable methane. Um, that heat uh, can be used um, to um, heat buildings, and um, so we, we intend to try to capture that, to kind of close that loop. Uh, electrolysis also um, uh, rejects some heat during, during its um, process, and so we can also capture that as well. So that's an area that we're working on um, on this process. We want to take that water, be able to recycle that, recapture some of those nutrients, and send that clean water back to the electrolysis, so that that um, the electrolyzer, so that closes that loop. And then, of course, that that methane um, is um, then put into the natural gas um, storage network as um, something that's renewable. And while it's not not carbon negative, it is carbon neutral. Um, and we mean that where we aren't having to go and dig up any more of that uh, methane from underground. We're keeping everything up, up above using biogas um, supplied uh, or carbon from biogas, which is um, a natural and biological um, process that's above ground. And we're not having to pull up any more, any more um, natural gas for our heat and power. So that's the whole idea around uh, this process. Okay, we'll work on step two now. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that biocatalyst. Um, so the, like, like everyone has said, both uh, Martin and, and Kevin, um, this is a single-celled uh, microorganism. Super interesting, um, interesting bug. Um, it's like a bacteria, it belongs to the class of RK organisms. Um, which I didn't even know existed when I was um, in school. Uh, they're, they're relatively new. Um, early 80s um, is when uh, they uh, were, were discovered. 
and uh, people started to um, study. So there are an entirely different class of, of organism compared to bacteria. Uh, this particular um, uh, bug can be found in the um, deep sea well vents and in hot springs, um, but they can also be found in wastewater treatment plants and, um, and anaerobic digesters, as I had uh, mentioned um, before. Um, this particular bug was actually um, uh, just pulled out of a, um, a cell bank um, in Germany um, by a professor at the University of Chicago, Dr. Metz. And um, he worked with this bug for, um, for about a decade, um, doing some um, evolving and transferring and really working on the robustness of, the, of this thing. And um, eventually licensed uh, the organism to Electrokea. And um, Electrokea is a German company that's uh, working on uh, this technology. Uh, with us and is a partner um, in, in our work here at NREL. And um, the robustness uh, that he particularly focused on was on oxygen, to be able to uh, tolerate a little bit of oxygen, which makes the organism a lot easier to handle. Even though it's anaerobic um, and, and grows, uh, prefers to not have any oxygen around, um, having a little bit of tolerance makes us um, able to move it from one place to another. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about uh, this bug is that um, it is very um, specific in, in what it makes. So it doesn't make any intermediates. It's 100% methane that comes from, from the organism with a small amount of energy and carbon going to just maintaining the cell population. Um, so it is self-replicating. -replic um, and that's um, very good for, for a process that you're not making anything anything extra and that your carbon isn't um, getting wasted on, on, on something that you don't um, want it to go to. Um, the organism also, uh, because it comes from deep sea well vents, uh, it, it grows at a very hot temperature. We have it down as moderate when you think about temperatures for chemical reactions, but for biological life, 60 to 65 degrees is, is really hot. That's 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so that reactor is really hot to the touch um, when, when we're you know, working um, with the bug. Um, and then the other thing that uh, is, is also really interesting is that um, we can turn this bug on and off, almost like a light switch. So it also follows um, the electrolyzer which then follows the renewable um, electricity. And so it's very responsive, very quick. Well, we lost the computer. So very, very interesting. <laughs> it keeps shutting down on us. So, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the, about the microorganism. Um, so as a microbiologist, this is a fermentation um, process and so, um, just to sort of give people a, a, an, an idea of, you know, what it's like to work with, um, we received a little uh, vial of the bugs from Germany. And um, I grew, started growing them, much like how you would um, pitch yeast for a homebrew, if anybody's a home brewer, or um, if you're making sourdough bread and you have a culture, a small culture that you put into your flour and your water and your salt. Um, it's much the same way. I got this small vial and I threw it into a smaller um, little reactor and grew those um, organisms up over time. So it was a continuous process. It makes water, it makes um, repl self replicate. So I pull a little bit of those um, organisms out and, um, and save them. And the robustness factor of the organism uh, lets me be able to just uh, store those um, bugs at room temperature because they're thermotolerant. They grow at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Sitting at room temperature is like being in a refrigerator. And when I had enough culture and we were ready to start um, up our bioreactor, um, which is 700 liters in uh, or 200 gallons in scale, um, I pitched or transferred um, this liquid culture uh, to the bioreactor. 
So that's the that's the bioreactor um, picture that I was talking about that we transferred um, those those uh, organisms into. It's the really tall column with, um, and it's very hard to see, but there's a green um, motor that sits on top. So that's what the reactor um, looks like. A little bit different than what you would um, picture, you know, in in say a brewery. Um, and then just to give you a, a set of rule of, of rules of thumb uh, for uh, this process. Um, if we had 10 megawatt electrolyzer uh, feeding that bioreactor, we could possibly recycle about 20 tons of CO2 per day. Um, so as we scale this um, process up to the tens of megawatts, um, we could have a significant effect on the amount of CO2 um, that we can um, utilize. And then um, to give you a sense of you know what what it looks like data wise coming from that that bioreactor here's um, a graph of the first 40 hours of operational data. Um, so we're you know we were trying to you know learn how to work with the organism and learn how to work with this pressurized um, bioreactor. And in in this um, in this picture we're showing um, the CO2 concentration. That's the gray. Um, uh, circles uh, down below and how much methane is coming out of the exhaust and then what that conversion looks like and um, we were changing um, pressure in the reactor so remember we um, have a reactor that can go up to 18 bar and we do that because that helps with getting hydrogen dissolved into uh, the water so that it can get to the microorganism and we also have an agitator that we can play with. And as you can see that we were increasing pressure um, from six to seven, and we were getting a slight increase in conversion. But when we increase that agitation um, up to a 50% increase, we really got a big um, boost in um, our uh, methane production. And that conversion, uh, which is essentially how much CO2 is um, being converted into that methane, was about 98% there. And you can see that that, um, that CO2 concentration was nearly um, zero. And so just to give you, a, a, you know, an idea, these are the kind of levers that we have to, um, to, to move so that we can improve our flow rates in and our amount of product um, coming out. And so that kind of leads me to this um, next slide, which is a little busy, um, and there's a lot here, but it gives you a sense of what we're, um, what we're really focused on in terms of our, of our R&D. Um, starting with um, first bringing this uh, piece of equipment online, commissioning um, it, um, developing the controls and all the protocols and safety systems that need to be in place when you're dealing with hydrogen and, and methane. Um, and then these, these are also projects that um, the DOE is funding for us along with um, Southern California Gas. Um, we're also taking a step back and, and uh, we are going to downscale um, the reactor so that we have a mobile unit that we can take to different uh, CO2 sources as part of um, some of our research, along with um, focusing on analytical and our techno-economics so that we can understand uh, you know, what this is all, what it costs and how we can improve on that. Um, I talked about that this is a, a really interesting marriage of uh, electricity and biology. And so we're, we are really focused on integrating that electrolyzer with the bioreactor. And we um, have some really interesting um, ideas that we're working with University of Chicago and Dr. Metz on, on how we can um, do this um, very efficiently and be able to reduce um, costs. And then finally, um, this just doesn't stop with renewable natural gas. Um, there's a, lots of microorganisms out there that do some really interesting things with just hydrogen and, and CO2, um, where we can make fit food and we can make um, uh, chemicals. And so this is really um, the beginning of our work um, in this area to um, move electrons into uh, molecules. 
And this slide, you know, really kind of captures, um, you know, this one to 10 years out where we're looking at um, these gas for Um, so, so it was really interesting with this particular project, um, you know, my first reaction was why on earth would we be making um, fossil or renewable natural gas when fossil gas is so cheap? And, um, and the answer to that is that there's actually markets with renewable natural gas out there already. Um, so it, it is its own market. Um, there are the, the low carbon fuel standards and the um, RFS, the renewable fuel standard um, that's federal and the low carbon fuel um, uh, LC, LCFS um, in California. Um, they provide um, a way of paying for uh, these, uh, these fuels that um, have low, lower carbon intensity. And so there's a whole market out there for um, renewable natural gas that comes from dairies and uh, landfills and wastewater treatment. And so that's the market that we're actually um, trying to, uh, you know, compete with um, rather than uh, fossil natural gas. So, um, so setting up that context, there is a market for renewable um, natural gas that comes from these um, biogas sources. And so. Um, here at Enro, you know, we are um, looking at trying to achieve parity with um, those um, that that market, and in this kind of sh this shows you that as you vary electricity prices, um, you can um, and, and take advantage of some of these CO2 credits. You can actually bring that um, cost of the um, renewable methane down to about ten dollars per mmbtu. Um, and if you look at that in terms of uh, LCFS credit, uh, there are actually uh, sources, particularly dairy, if you see that um, bar right in the middle, that big blue bar, that um, they're, they're getting $45 per, per MMBTU because it's such a carbon negative um, uh, fuel. And, and just also to put into context, you know, we are working with a uh, utility company up in Maine, Summit Utility. And last year, uh, last winter, they were paying about $9 per MMBTU for uh, their natural gas, and that's fossil natural gas. So uh, the cost of natural gas is not the same across the entire U.S., and there are um, places in the U.S. where it's actually pretty expensive. And okay, we're almost finished here. This is um, our, our, the folks that we are working with. Um, Southern California Gas Company has been an excellent partner um, and funder of the work that we're doing here. That's Ron Kent um, with the bioreactor in the background. Um, SoCal Gas is very focused on uh, their decarbonizing um, with a goal of 20% of RNG in their uh, pipeline by 2030. Um, and then Electric K is our technology uh, provider, and um, this is Doris, the, the CTO of the company, um, and she has been remarkable in helping us um, get our reactor um, up and running and teaching me uh, the ways of this um, of this microorganism. And then finally, those are the energy or the, the DOE offices that have funded um, this uh, work for the last few years the hydrogen fuel cell um, technology office, bioenergy, and solar energy. And I think that was it. Um, there's me, my contact information, and, um, and Kevin. Uh, that's a picture of a ribbon cutting ceremony about a year ago. Um, to the left is Martin Keller, our uh, lab director. Uh, the, the lady in red is one of the program uh, managers for the hydrogen fuel cell technology office. Doris and Kent are there along with the SoCal gas exec and then uh, myself and Kevin. And I think that's it. <laughs> so, wow, uh, that was a little rough. Um, so we will definitely take questions and I don't know if it'll be easier if we take it by phone or, you know. Yeah, we can we can always call in. So I think that's it. 
Okay, very well. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, do you want to first switch over to a phone line or? Um, uh, I think we'll continue until it, um, until it stops again for some reason and then we'll call in quick. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so my friend Leslie Glostrom has a question here. She asks, um, what analysis is being done on leak rate and fugitive emissions in that process? Yeah, I get that question quite a lot um, because it's important, of course, that you're not letting these greenhouse gases go. So I just want to remind everyone that this is a process where we capture and upgrade CO2 and also keep the renewable natural gas, the methane. Um, and our partners um, across the board have been working to tighten up their natural gas system. So they know, of course, flaring is a problem and, and leaks are a problem. Uh, our systems alone um, are, of course, leak checked and pressure tested. Even before we started this up, we pressurized it to make sure there's no leaks. Um, so as far as leaks from our system, um, there aren't any because we've done the pressure testing. As far as utilities fixing their system to reduce leaks, um, that's something they'll continue to work on and perfect. Okay, and uh, at this point, I might want to add there's um, a, a leak detection technology used to be uh, pretty um, pretty rough. Uh, you had these sniffer bands who would drive alongside uh, production sites once a month. But there's new technology coming out now that's a lot cheaper and that will detect leaks in real time. So uh, with any luck, we're going to have uh, better detection um, coming. Okay, so let me go to another question. Um, there's the question about the depreciation rate of such systems. Yeah, so yeah. when we do our techno-economic and life cycle analysis, we assume a 20-year lifespan yeah. for this equipment. And uh, just speaking briefly about electrolyzer systems, they're rated to the same sort of lifespan, 20 to 25 years. And um, and there's, of course, maintenance, and perhaps after 10 years, you have to make some uh, significant investment to replace the electrolyzer stack, for example. But this is all taken into account for our uh, techno-economics for a 20-year life. And how NREL TEA analysts do it is they use very typical um, commercially ways of depreciating equipment value and things like that. So it is a it is a fair assessment alongside how corporate America would depreciate equipment. Okay, and another question here is how is CO2 captured at the various sites discussed? Uh, for instance, let's take the dairy farms. How, how would they capture CO2? Yeah, this is very interesting. I visited I visited a dairy farm in California a couple of years ago, and um, I walked on the tarp that they put over their manure field that captures the gases. So in the case of dairies, I can um, personally comment on the fact that they they would tarp over um, their, their manure, um, which gets, you know, continually refilled. The gases, as things decompose, they release methane and CO2. It's caught, it's caught into this, uh, this tarp system, which is uh, inflated. I actually walked up on it while it was inflated, so it, it was presumably safe, I hope. Um, and that's how the gases are captured. And then those would be presented, both the methane and the CO2 to the bioreactor, along with the hydrogen. And that's where the organisms would do the work. I might add too that when um, we were in Denmark, um, there was very large wastewater treatment um, facility there that was actually just a huge concrete um, 
uh, tanks uh, that uh, were actually enclosed. So there are systems that are somewhat enclosed as well. Just depends on whether it's wastewater treatment or if it's you know out in a manure field. I think landfills are probably the, the um, most challenging uh, to capture the CO2. But landfills also have gas collection but systems. They do have gas collection systems. Yeah. So I think that's how it would be done. Yeah, I would uh, add here that uh, in Europe, um, the key word uh, in this whole endeavor is sector coupling. And I think that is one um, one thing that we need to work more on, um, namely to, to look at various waste streams and production cycles and see how we can somehow integrate them with technology. Um, so uh, one other uh, thing that I want to bring up here is uh, California is actually actively trying to get rid of natural gas um, through a legislative uh, pathway, namely new construction for buildings uh, uh, is um, slated not to have any more connections to the natural gas network. And I wonder how this uh, kind of policy path might affect uh, what you are trying to do here? No, that's a good question. And we know they're um, they're looking at multiple ways to decarbonize uh, their economy. Um, you know, there, there's everything from the electricity only group to um, other groups that see the value in renewable fuels. So we'll, we'll see how that policy works out. Um, but I think they are talking about that across the board. Um, but I will admit that the people I speak to in California that haven't heard a lot about renewable natural gas, they always ask for this slide deck after the end of the call because if you can if you can decarbonize the natural gas grid, much the same way that we've been decarbonizing the electricity grid uh, using wind and solar, if we can do that with the natural gas grid by making more renewable fuels, um then uh that seems like a nice balance between electricity only and um maybe abandoning one of the largest energy storage systems um that we have namely the existing natural gas network well and i think the conversation kind of changed a little bit too in the i think the past week when um, they had those rolling blackouts in california and um, so, so I think that really pointed to, you know, this grid resilience that isn't quite there yet um, because they're not prepared um, to be able to store, you know, large amounts of renewable um, electricity from solar. Um, and so, you know, when everybody comes home and it's super hot and they're turning on all their air conditioners, um, they, they weren't able to keep up with that. And so now there's talk of, of not shutting down some of those older um, gas-fired uh, power plants yet because um, we're not quite we're not quite there yet so so I, I think that was you know definitely um, shows that there's this need um, to be able to uh, bridge um, between going um, solely electric and and, um, and and being able to substitute this for a, a, a cleaner, lower, lower carbon um, fuel. And then I also might add too that um, up in um, Seattle, or up in, I think it was Washington, there was a town up there um, that, you know, wants to go completely, they, they're not allowing any nat natural gas uh, new construction and, um, and talking about going completely electric. And, and it's really interesting because to do that, you know, you're gonna have to do a, quite a bit of retrofitting as well to houses. Um, and and that's going to cost uh, consumers money. So so I you know I don't know if it's if it's entirely possible to go all the way to electric for um, all of our our energy needs at least not um, in the near future. Yeah, I don't see him in our attendee list, but we've had a presenter a couple times, uh, Ken Regelson, uh, who has been uh, making clear to us that. Uh, the closer you get to 100%, the 
the more expensive it becomes to take care of that remaining percentage. And uh, he suggested that it would actually make a lot of economic sense and might also be um, environmentally justifiable um, to keep feeding those remaining five or 10% uh, of electricity from um, combined cycle um, gas power plants. And in your scenario, these then could be uh, fueled by renewable natural gas. So that is an interesting perspective. Exactly, exactly. So do you have uh, other comments on the feasibility of this whole project? I, I did see another slide um, in, a, in a deck that you sent to me, which um, outlined the pathway towards such uh, towards financial viability. And, and maybe you'd want to uh, go into those hurdles um, in a bit more detail. Yeah, yeah in front of you. I, I think the the main takeaway for the um, attendees is that you need to start with low cost electricity, um, and if it's low carbon, then you're off to a good start. The slide you're referring to is a techno-economic slide. And the second biggest challenge is reducing the capital cost of the electrolyzer system. And work, we work closely uh, with electrolyzer manufacturers here at NREL. We're actually testing someone's 750 kilowatt electrolyzer stack right now. And they have a pathway to reduce their costs, cut them about in half. Um, and then when you get to that point, you start competing with steam methane reforming. Now, it's the first time we brought that up in this conversation, but that's how most of the hydrogen is made today. But if you can cut your electrolyzer capital cost in half and you can have low cost electricity, you can compete with steam methane reforming, which provides 95% of the hydrogen. Remember, remember back to one of my first slides, we make 10 million metrons of hydrogen each year. Most of that comes from SMR, steam methane reforming. So if you have electricity and you have capital costs, you can start to think about low cost competitive hydrogen. And if you have that, you can start producing by recycling CO2 and taking advantage of these existing carbon markets that Nancy talked about into renewable natural gas that is also less than $10. And that is competitive with other ways of making renewable natural gas. So that is the pathway, Martin, I think, to the megawatt scale and beyond. We talk about 10 megawatts of electrolysis. That's a very big system. Um, and then beyond that, what is a 20 megawatt or a 50 megawatt electrolyzer system tied to wind or solar? You know, how low can we really get the costs of the hydrogen? And then renewable natural gas, if you have a carbon source. I just noticed that um, my window was a little too small and there have been a number of uh, additional questions that have come in. So I'll, I'll just start with those. How much energy from the grid does the system um, uh, require when the grid is working under load, if I understand this correctly? Well, I, I will say that this two step process first being hydrogen production consumes 90 to 95 percent of the energy of the overall two-step process so the bioreactor if, if the um, contact information is still being shown that's behind ron kent uh, with the scissors that consumes about five to ten percent of the energy so if you had a, a megawatt electrolyzer um, you would need you know, 50 kilowatts worth of energy spinning electric motors on the bioreactor. So you could have a 10 megawatt system or a one. Ours is about a 250 kilowatt electrolyzer feeding that bioreactor. So step two, the main takeaway here is step two doesn't require a lot of energy. 
Okay. Uh, then there is the question, what is the likely potential of RNG as a percentage of current fossil methane use? Pretty low percentage right now. Okay. Yeah. But uh, I think she's asking for the potential. Right. Yeah. right. And uh, honestly, we, we can't, I don't have an, a good number. I don't know if that's a uh, 1% or 5 or 10% yeah. or 25%, but we're working on getting that number. But th that's a natural question to ask. How much of a how much could you move the needle with RNG compared with fossil? And we don't have a good answer for you today. Um, a, affirmative answer to know if we took advantage of the dairies and the landfills you know, in the wastewater treatment plants, how much that would amount to. But it's a good question. Sorry, we don't have a better answer. But it's, a, it's definitely not going away. I mean, uh, this is how we deal with our waste streams. So so we, we have been, um, you know, producing renewable natural gas um, since we've been um, producing waste. So it's a, it's a natural process. Um, and, and so it's, so we need to take advantage of, of this um, for sure. And um, certainly technology needs to um, catch up to the point where we can uh, capture uh, this, this, uh, the gases and make that um, cheap. I also thought it was really interesting um, when you mentioned that there's a ton of um, bioorganisms out there who make all kinds of stuff. So this entire right. sector of bioreactors uh, can totally uh, blossom into creating um, substances we use for industrial processes uh, all across the board. At least the potential is there. And I think what we're learning here um, with this process may also percolate into creating bioreactors for very different um, organisms and uh, um, products. Absolutely. I mean, um, we have a project right now um, at NREL that's um, kind of the reverse of what we're doing. So basically takes uh, methane um, and produces uh, chemicals um, from that. And can certainly use the, um, the, the same equipment that we're um, working with and, um, you know, learn and learnings um, in terms of gas mass transfer, breaking the, the gases down to small bubbles, um, that sort of thing. So so this equipment isn't, you know, just specific for um, producing renewable um, natural gas. Um, it can be used for uh, a lot of other things. Okay, there's one other question. It's, uh, it says, what kind of data are you working with to check uh, the efficiency of the system? Yeah, I will. Um, I'll kick this off, and then I'll let Nancy take it from here. <laughs> so, as far as the electrolyzer goes, um, once you dry the hydrogen, you can measure how much um, hydrogen is flowing or CO2 is flowing using a Coriolis mass flow sensor. Coriolis is the state-of-the-art um, ways of measuring gas flow. It is the most accurate. It takes advantage of the Coriolis effect. Um, you can look that up. It's a natural effect that has to do with the earth and moving gases. Um, so we use Coriolis mass flow sensors to monitor flow rates. We use temperature and pressure uh, sensors to monitor the, the health of the system so it doesn't get out of bounds. And then one of the most important pieces that I'll let Nancy talk about is the gas uh, chromatograph. Yes, so we use gas chromatography um, to measure the um, exhaust um, gas, um, the, the product gas coming um, off the top of the reactor. Um, and so that measures hydrogen concentration, uh, CO2, measures hydrogen sulfide because we do have, um, we feed the organism sodium sulfide and we've got hydrogen that we're feeding. So, so we do have to watch um, that concentration. Um, and what else are we, uh, in methane. Of course, methane. Um, and then the, one of the other um, sets of data too that we um, keep uh, close track on is uh, we actually measure the reactor um, uh, liquid level um, because that's also another indication of 
of the productivity of the orb microorganism as it's making methane, it's also making uh, water. And um, so we have a differential pressure uh, sensors on top and bottom that um, actually measures the column um, uh, height uh, through differential pressure. And um, so taking all of that data um, together, we're able to um, see how efficient the organism is in producing uh, uh, methane. Uh, so there's un uh, one other question that I have. When you mentioned that your bioreactor um, is essentially this uh, slender pipe, um, mm -hmm. I, I wonder about scalability. Um, if you were to, or or tell me what uh, what size in terms of gallons or liters uh, would you consider an industrial size bioreactor? Yeah, so and the how would it compare to uh, what you have currently on right. the panel? Yeah, so like we talked about the. The, the bioreactor is about 18 inches in diameter, about 20 foot tall, and that can handle the gas from a 250 kilowatt electrolyzer. Our partner, Electrokea, has done this at the one megawatt scale. So they've oh. had one megawatt electrolysis. And they've done this in Copenhagen, and they've also done this in Switzerland. And they have a reactor, um, of course, which is has a larger diameter and it's taller and it's more like 3,500 liters. So ours is seven, theirs is 35, there's about a 5X difference there in volume. Um, and there's also about a 5X difference in power level, right? 700 times five is 3,500 and our reactor is about a 250 kilowatt. So you see that four to 5X um, multiplier to get to a megawatt and then it would be a proportional scaling to get to 10 megawatts, for example. Yeah, and to just give you an idea, so we are modeling some of the cellulose um, or that corn ethanol plants out there are in the um, 200 to 500,000 liter um, scale. Um, so, so actually, if you're looking at, um, you know, scaling this up to even 50,000 liters, that's considered a small tank um, in industrial fermentation uh, language. So the Archer Daniel Midland and the Cargills of the world are, are dealing with uh, even at 10x uh, larger uh, tanks than what we would be um, considering. So it's really sized okay. to the electrolyzer, honestly. Yeah, there's a question that fits in nicely here. It's the idea to have the RNG systems located at the CO2 sites. Yeah, that's a perfect question. And, and we will answer that with a yes, um, <laughs> because ideally you're co-located uh, at the biogas sites and you can bring in the electrolyzer and co-locate that at a biogas site and you could bring in the bioreactor. Right now it would be harder but maybe not impossible to move the biogas to a solar field or a wind field where you could put the electrolyzer. So I think it would be best, the earliest projects will probably be co-located at a biogas site. You might be at a wastewater treatment plant or a dairy. You can bring in the electrolyzer, you can bring in the bioreactor, and then put the output gas into the natural gas network, which goes to, you know, most homes and most businesses already. So presumably you would have a, a pretty easy shot to get into the natural gas network with your product. So that is something that we are trying to understand um, as we work with um, utility companies, um, because it could be very site specific um, and depend really on their location and their supply of renewable um, electricity and how much that's gonna cost um, versus you know trying to move the CO2 to it. So um, we would prefer to be at the CO2 source, um, but you know that it may depend. Okay, um, looks like we're almost out of time. Um, so I'm, I, I thank you all for hanging in there. I <laughs> yeah. want yeah. to uh, just finally emphasize uh, what I appreciate so much about uh, NREL. It took uh, almost 40 years to bring solar 
um, into the mainstream. Uh, you may know that uh, NREL started out as SERI, the Solar uh, Energy Research Institute. Um, and I think it's a perfect example why we need basic research and why we need this close cooperation between industry um, and research institutions because um, uh, industry does uh, has totally different time horizons uh, uh, to uh, they need to get to a product that is saleable fast um, and uh, with our tax dollars we have the leisure of, of for much different time horizons and uh, we're okay with not all of the projects are uh, coming to fruition um, but as we heard here um, there are different ways of um, solving the energy problem that we're facing and the environmental problem with climate change and we need to look at all of them in depth. And I thank you very much, Kevin uh, and Nancy for having done that. Uh, finally, uh, do you mind if some of our participants um, email you or uh, check out your work at NREL? Um, is that fine with you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and uh, since apparently that that contact slide isn't easily uh, viewable, it's cut off. Uh, I'll just mention that uh, pretty much all the email addresses at NREL can be looked up at nrel.gov, um, or if you know the exact name of the person, it's the first name dot last name uh, at nrel.gov. And with yep. that, uh, thank you again. Uh, uh, quickly, a recap that we are having the Seacrest meeting on Beyond Coal on the 3rd of September. The following week, it's Seacrest with what's next for Colorado's electric vehicle market. And yet another week later from Denver, the annual policy night was the PUC's Megan Gilman and State Senator Chris Hansen. So with that, uh, I thank you for your attention and bearing with us with those technical issues. And we'll see you at a different webinar in the future, I hope. Okay, that's it for tonight. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And bye-bye. Bye-bye.